All right, everyone, welcome back again to some more Umineko. So in this particular part of the episode, we are, it's more, it's more uh, focused on Ushiromiya Kinzo, the grandfather, finally. I almost forgot that name, by the way. That's why I was like a little, I was pausing. But we're getting more in-depth info about him, and it's very interesting what he's going through and his own character. Like, we got glimpses of it in the very beginning of the prologue. And now we got more of what's going on with him here. So we're going to continue on from there, guys. And I hope you all can enjoy. So with all that said, let's keep it going. All right, everyone. And we are back again. I thought it was so great that we could all chat with the adult siblings sitting in their group and us cousins and ours. However, now that I can re-examine the seating order after growing up a bit, it stirs up some very complicated feelings in me. Aunt Natsuhi married to the eldest son of the family, responsible for managing the household, and number two for all practical intents and purposes, sat to my right, which meant that she was two steps lower than me in the ranking order. It was difficult to guess what was going through her head. That's why I made a small apologetic gesture before we sitting down. いつの間にかこんな身長に。さすが男の子ね。身長はいくつくらいあるの ?180かな。つうかおばさん、そこは食べてばっかりじゃねえかって突っ込んでくださいよ。えああ。ごめんなさいね。<笑> After a moment, she gave a small laugh, but it seemed she couldn't quite figure out what she was supposed to be laughing at. This woman is Aunt Natsuhi. She's the wife of the eldest son of the family, meaning she is my dad's older brother's wife. Is it easier to get it if I call her Jessica's mother? It feels bad to say it like this, but not that I hated her, but I didn't particularly like her. She never got into our kid's circle, and my only impression of her was as someone who was always talked about complicated stuff with my parents while having a crabby expression on her face. The fact is, that having barely ever exchanged words, I hesitated a lot, even just now, about how to approach her. And it was pretty much a flop. The silverware had been t tidily set up on the table, but the meal itself hadn't been brought in. As a rule, the meal doesn't start until the man at the head of the table has taken a seat. So, as long as the grandfather, the highest rank, didn't come, lunch would be indefinitely on hold. Not even the appetizers would come. In other words, this silence in the dining hall was the sound of our parents as they withstood their hunger and waited on tenter hooks for a grandfather to come. Except, the grandfather I remembered always showed up at the right time when we ate together like this. He wouldn't ever have been so late as to have everyone else waiting on him. おせえな、じいさま。俺の記憶じゃ、時間に厳格な人だったと思うんだけどな。まあ、6年前はそうだったかもな。最近はそうでもねえよ。というか、もう自分の世界オンリーって感じで、会食にも顔を出さねえぜ
a voice calling father sometimes mingled with the knocks. As Kinzo heaved a deep sigh, he snapped shut the old book he had in his hands and slammed it on the table. Then he yelled at Kraus, who was continuing to knock on the door. お父さん。年に一度の親族会議の日ではありませんか。皆下に集まっています。どうかおいでください。Kraus called out to his father through the door. Kinzo always shut himself up in the study and hated letting even his family into the room. For that reason, Kraus had no choice but to call out thus from the corridor. That is some grandfather, right? <laughs> バラバラにして巻きにして魔女の炉に詰めてしまい。その炉には鍋をかけて苦い重みを煮るがいい。目白くの煮汁はそれでも私をここから連れ出そうとするバカ者どもに飲ませてやれ。残りは酒につけるの
親父はすでに死んでいるここにいるのは親父だったものの幻さいずれにせよ本人にここを出る意思がない以上どうにもならんね金蔵さん Choking cost continued to pour from the study. 私は下に戻るゴーダの自慢のランチをこれ以上無駄に冷ましてしまうことはない親類たちにとって当家での数少ない楽しみだろうからな<笑> Kraus spun on his heels He looked at his wristwatch mumbling and acting as though he had wasted time doing something he knew would be in vain Genji さん親父殿がお呼びだ相手を頼むかしこまりました南条先生、食事に行きましょう。いつまでもここにいると、この甘い匂いで味覚までおかしくなってしまう。Without waiting for Nanjo, Kraus went downstairs. Genji urged Nanjo to go and eat. Nanjo looked first to Kraus' back as he disappeared from the stairs, then to the study door, and he let out a deep sigh. すまんが、ゲンジさん。頼みます。はい。お任せください。お酒は、なるべく与えないように。あれは常習性が強すぎる。源氏はまだか何者が源氏を阻んでいるというのかうわぁ、源氏はどこだ源氏を呼べいさあ、ここは、お任せください。うん、すみませんな。ランジョー gave a small duck of his head and descended the stairs. 源氏 saw him off and knocked at the study door. 親方様、源氏でございます。源氏か何故私をこれほどに待たすのかそこには誰もおるまいな。はい、私だけでございます。金蔵 returned to his seat in the study and pressed an old fashioned switch on the table. After a small delay, the heavy sound of the door unlocking could be heard. Kinzo believed that his family might try to break into his study. Perhaps someone once opened a window for some air and scattered some important documents or something. And that had made him extremely upset. Now Kinzo had placed a secure lock in his room, making it so that without his permission nobody could enter, and locking himself in the dungeon he himself created. Genji, who he trusted the most, was relatively free to enter the room, but even that was not absolute. If Kinzo was in a bad mood, even he wouldn't be able to enter. Anyone else would be limited to holding a conversation through the door, not even seeing his face. And most of the time, they wouldn't even get a real conversation. However, they didn't pose any particular problem for the family. That was because they had no reason to go out of their way to interfere with the retirement of the cantankerous and aged head. The fact that he was completely immersed in his odd research and always locked up in his hideaway was something of a benefit. They made the most of his refusal to leave the study, entrusting him to the hands of the servants while they themselves kept their distance. Genji, I always ask you. I'm busy. Yes. Genji headed to a corner of the study. There, suspicious looking bottles boasting venomous colors were on display. They were actually liquor, but considering they were placed in his shady looking room, you could almost suspect they might be ghastly poisons. The inside of the study was filled with the mountainous library of outlandish books that Kinzo had amassed. They were bizarre old books, some banned, and each and every one of them either forbidden, cursed, or sealed. Of course, if one were to actually call them old books, Kinzo would fly into a rage and say something like this Call them Grimoires. There were candles which had melted in a suspicious looking fashion and taken on peculiar forms and all manner of other strange objects, probably having something to do with black magic. The constellations covering the celestial globe would have caused anyone who knew the night sky well to raise an eyebrow. The illustrations described in the old books haphazardly left open range from the religious and mystical to the demonic and grotesque, as well as bizarre diagrams of various magic circles. Oh, he's messing with things that he shouldn't be messing with, is what I'm reading right now. That's, that's what I'm hearing. Those are the things you don't want to touch upon ever. And above all, the sweet poisonous smell that filled the room. Which to those entering for the first time would surely be a profound assault on their sense of sight, smell, and all, of, and all their other senses, making them lose their grip on reality. Inside that study, Genji, with his well trained hand, prepared Kinzo's usual drink. If you didn't know that the ghastly dark green liquid that filled the comp 
complexly designed bottle with liquor, you certainly wouldn't want to put it in your mouth. He poured a small quantity of spirit into the glass, placed a cube of sugar in a strangely shaped spoon, and then poured water from a pitcher over it. Strangely, when the colorless water was poured into it, the dark green liquid turned a cloudy white. It created the strange visual illusion that the water had caused a chemical reaction which made it all the more difficult to perceive the concoction as liquor. To this, he added an original flavoring that Kinzo liked and fine-tuned the taste. There was no recipe. Its success was measured only by Kinzo's mood swing when he drank it, and he had learned how to make it only after many decades. Genji placed the glass on a tray and made his way over to Kinzo. Kinzo was now gazing out the window. Dozo, Oyakata-sama. Ah, shunan. Kinzo had regained his composure so much so that he was now unrecognizable as the man who had been shouting, screaming, and yelling just moments before. In that man's black, a uh, black wow. In that man's back dwelt the dignity and intelligence made plain simply by how he tilted his glass and gazed down at the scenery beyond the window. Genji, in order to allow Kinzo to set down his glass any time. Motionlessly waited behind and to his left as though he were li a living sideboard. As he did, Kinzo stuck out his stuck out just the glass, his gaze still directed at the world outside the window. There was just a mourn mouthful of remaining. It was not a gesture intended to set it upon the tray as Genji expected, but was a motion to hand the glass over to Genji. <laughs> Genji respectfully received the glass <coughs> excuse me, and inclined it a little to taste its contents. Then he downed it in one gulp. <laughs> <laughs> Kinzo smiled at his loyal subject who refused to put aside rank even when asked to. However, he was not making fun of him. It was relaxed, like a smile at a close friend's unridable bad habit. Kinzo gave a thin smile as to say he didn't need compliments. ふふふ。今日まで本当によく私に仕えてくれた。息子たちは誰もが私を変人呼ばわりした。大勢いたしようにも皆私を恐れてやめていった。お前だけが<笑> もったいない言葉です。私の嫁もそう長くはあるまい。息子たちは私の遺産がいつ転がり込んでくる顔をうろうろ待つ剥げたかばかりだ。クラウスの愚か者は金を湯水のように使い、一枚の金貨を売るの
、逃がさぬ、逃がさぬ、逃がさぬ、逃がさぬわ。お前は私のものだ。常に私の腕の中でなくてはならん。私の生涯のすべてなのだ。我が鳥かごにて永遠に私に、私だけに囁き続けるのだベアトリーチなぜに、微笑み返してはくれぬ I can safely assume it's because you have her held captive from how you're describing this whole scenario. <laughs> What I will say though is, I am loving this voice actor. He is really committed. <laughs> <laughs> like, you can feel how insane he's getting. Becoming. After howling, Kinzo choked once again. Genji set the tray and the glass down and patted his master's back. Genji's facial expression did not change. It was always like this. <laughs> After his almost deranged outburst of the past few minutes settled down, Kinzo regained his composure once more. The way his attitude changed was like seeing two different people a wild Kinzo and a composed Kinzo living together inside one body. この身に最後に徒するコインがあるならば、それを悪魔たちのルーレットに託してみたい。魔法の力はいつもかけるリスクで決まる。日本古来の呪術である牛の国参りがそうであろう。7日間、儀式を目撃されてはならないというリスクを支払うからこそ、魔力が宿る。困難なリスクが生じれば生じるほどに魔力は強く生じるのだ。神話に登場する数々の奇跡は、天文学的リスクに奇跡的な低確率を得て成就した、驚愕すべき魔力の結晶なのだと言える。モーゼが海を割ったのは神の奇跡ではない。蹂林の計りに乗せられ、軍勢によって航海に追い詰められた、絶対絶命のリスクが、奇跡の魔力を生んだのだ。同じことが同じ規模で繰り返されようとも、再び海が割れることはないだろう。なぜなら、モーゼは、力ある者たちのルーレットの麻生儀、ナユタをかけたよりも多く存在する目の中に一つだけ刻まれた奇跡を見事引き寄せることができたからだ。I'm still trying to understand what the green highlighted words mean. I'm assuming it's a clue though, like it's gonna be important later in this game. その天文学的確率に勝利できる力。そう、奇跡を掴み取る運気はすなわち魔力なのだ。強大な魔力を得るためには絶望的なリスクを背負わねばならぬ。魔力持たぬ者は、それを賭けでなく自暴自棄と呼ぼう。しかし、真に魔力ある者はその奇跡を掴み取り、神秘を成就させるのだ。もしも私にその魔力があるならば、私はその奇跡を掴み取るだろう。生涯を費やした願いを実現できるだろう。Kinzo looked up to the sky outside the window. He spread his arms as if appealing to someone up in the sky. もし、私にその奇跡を手にする資格があったなら、おーベアトリーチェベアトリーチェお前の愛くるしい笑顔をもう一度だけ見せてくれどれほどの月日を経ようともお前の面影が消えることはないただお前の美少が見たいそれだけだ
。お前から授かったものをすべて返そう。あの日からの栄光をすべてお前に返そう。富も名誉も黄金もいらぬ。お前に授かったすべてを返そう。私はただお前の美少が見たいだけなのだ。ご少だ、ベアトリーチ。Such a good actor, man. おお。His nonsensical yell seeped into a scream and then into a wall. Kinzo crumpled onto the floor and clawed at it with both hands. Genji had no choice but to wordlessly watch over his master's lament. Ya, Sokum. Toshu Sama wa guai ga sugure rare nai to no koto da. Sekkak kou shite ichi nen buri no kaigo ni atsumatte kureta Sokum to chushoku o tomo ni deki nai koto o hijou ni zannen ni shite orare ta. ゴーだ。ランチを始めてくれ。かしこまりました。それでは本日の昼食を始めさせていただきます。南条先生、そんなにお父様のお具合は悪いのせめて顔くらい見せてくれてもいいわよね。体調というよりは、機嫌ですな。こればかりは、つける薬がありませんので。おいおい、機嫌ってまたかよ。そりゃないぜ。こっちとら、秋のクソ忙しい時期にスケジュール都合して、ご機嫌伺いに来てるんだ。それをよ。<笑>よかったじゃないか、ルドルフ。ご機嫌は伺えたんだ。それとも、不機嫌な親父殿を私に代わり、お前が説得して連れてきてくれるのかねまっさか。Rudolph shrugged. Apparently, even though Rudolph seemed to resent the way his father did whatever he pleased, he'd rather avoid seeing his face if he could help it. Like father, like son, huh? Kurosuni <laughs> ゲンジさんだけだよ。じいさまの機嫌を直せるのは。情けないぜ。自分の親の機嫌を使用人に直させるんだからよ。ジェシカ、余計なことは言わなくていい。She planned for her complaint to be heard only by her cousins, but it had reached even Krause's ears. Scolded, Jessica scowled and turned away sulking. 機嫌がうんぬんってことは、病状はそんな悪くないんじゃねえの元気がないってんならともかく。機嫌が悪いってのは、少なくとも気はしっかりしてる証拠だぜ。おじいさまは、特に強い気力をお持ちだからね。でも、体が必ずしもそれに伴えるとは限らないよ。去年からずっと、余命3ヶ月って言われ続けてる。最初の診断が正しいなら、おじいさまは気力だけで流られてるってことになる。気遣ってあげないといけないよ。Lunch started with the family head seat still empty. The man who should have been sitting there was already old. And the brilliant glory which had rebuilt the Ushiromiya family in a single lifetime was slowly being forgotten. Nobody seemed to feel uncomfortable when the meal began with, the, with that seat still empty. Oh, what does that signify? Every time. 1.30 Alright, the Ushiromiya family conference was held once every year. It took place on the first weekend of October. If a normal family were to use a pretentious name like family conference, expect it to be nothing more than a reunion of rarely seen relatives who greet each other surrounded by buckets of sushi. However, in the Ushiromiya family, where the sons and siblings are lent great fortunes, and only those that achieve success in business are considered adults, it literally was a conference. 
How much of the fortune was invested? What kind of business was conducted? How much was earned? As a result, how much of the fortune borrowed from the main family could be repaid? Or, alternatively, how much would be borrowed for future business ventures? What lessons had they learned, and what could they learn from their mistakes? It seems that topics like these have been discussed very seriously in the past. Alright guys, this seems like a good stopping point for now. I'm going to end the video here for today. Thank you all for watching. We finally got a little bit more info or in-depth understanding of the grandfather, Kinzo himself, and how he's slowly losing his mind and declining ever so... <laughs> I wouldn't say slowly, but it's, it's mid-range in his life, his life force, his, his lifestyle, because there are times when he's like on and off with his moods and he's always crying towards Be Beatrice to help him and we don't know who Beatrice is if she's like a prisoner held captive, a spirit, I, I, at this point I'm curious so we're gonna continue on the next one guys so thank you all for watching, thank you all for the love and support and we'll continue on.